In this video, we'll be talking about the Power Macintosh 4400, the North American model. The Power Macintosh 4400 was introduced February 17, 1997, discontinued February 1998. It used the PowerPC 603E processor, this model running at 200 MHz. It had 32 MB of RAM installed. First off, I found out the hard way that the TV series, the 4400, actually had nothing to do with the Power Macintosh 4400. So don't bother with that. Apple has had a history of the worst management of the best brand and best product in Silicon Valley. I have viewed Apple's problems as fundamentally unfixable, such that it wasn't a question of the right strategy versus the wrong strategy. In 1996, Apple CEO Gil Emilio had replaced Michael Spindler, saving Apple from being sold off. But could Apple actually be saved at this point? Uh, what you're going to see over time is that we're going to simplify the product line. I might actually be able to remember what all the models mean. <laughs> Indeed, instead of a confusing array of the same machines, there would just be, say, one or two different models in each product line. And I know the 6400 was a tower, it's not really the point. The point is that Emilio was successful at this goal, but Apple still maintained a large number of product lines. At the time of the 4400, Apple already had eight Macintosh product lines on the go. First the PowerBooks, the 1000 series low-end PowerBooks, 2000 compact PowerBooks, the 3000 high-end PowerBooks, then the 5000 series all-in-one, 6000 consumer Mac, 7,000 mid-range desktop, 8,000 high-end tower, and the top-end 9,000 professional tower. Which left only one number unused, so Apple used it to release a bare-bones Macintosh with the same build philosophy as the Mac clones. They later recategorized it as a small business Macintosh. There's no doubt about that, it's written all over the box. The reason it was named 4400 was to put it in line with the current 5400 and 6400 Performas. The 5000 and 6000 series were typically branded as Performa, and not just for the home market, but for education as well. But the 4400 was a power Macintosh. It wasn't because they were trying to take a different direction with the 4400. It was that Performa was now a tainted brand, associated with cheap and underpowered Macs. I've probably made my dislike for them apparent in this video series. Apple discontinued the Performa name altogether in March 1997. The 4400 200 MHz was actually predated by the 4400 160 MHz, released four months earlier, exclusively in Europe. Also, the 4400 posed a problem for the Far East market. The Chinese believe the number four to be unlucky. That's because its Chinese pronunciation is almost identical to how the word DEATH is pronounced. So for that market, they lumped it in with the 7000 series, calling it the 7220. Otherwise identical to the North American model, which is the one I'll be talking about, it was released February 1997 along with a big roller of updated Macs, including the 3400, 5500, 6500, 7300, 8600 and 9600. All were powerful machines with excellent build quality. Nice change from the past, and proof that Emilio was making good on his plan. By the way, in April, Apple followed up with PC-compatible versions of the 4400 and the 7300. The 7300 with a Pentium card, and the 4400 with a Cyrix processor. I know, that sounds like a... But it was actually quite a good processor. In a time where Apple was struggling to compete with its own clone market, the 4400 was like Apple releasing their own Mac clone. They used the Tanzania motherboard, which Apple had co-designed with Motorola for the Star Max clones. Other than Apple's distinctive curved front bezel, the 4400 had a basic metal frame case that you would normally get with a Windows PC or a clone. It used a slow IDE hard drive, also known as ATA, 
generally only used by Apple in the Performas. This was instead of the superior but expensive SCSI drive. The IDE drive has a slightly shorter connector than the SCSI hard drive, but features jumpers so you could assign it as a master or slave device. It was always set to master because there was no facility to add a second hard drive in this machine. The CD-ROM was not SCSI either, it was also ATA and the interface was called ATAPI. Yet they still gave you a SCSI port for external devices. And for the first time introduced a cheaper manually switchable power supply, where previously Max could automatically switch between voltage standards. Not surprisingly, these cost-saving modifications would become standard on even the high-end Macs within a year or so. The 4400 came at an introductory price of $1,749. US Using industry standard parts had successfully brought the computer into price parity with the clones, and even Windows computers for that matter. Clone maker power computing was stealing the spotlight on speed, because they were getting the new processors to market faster, and they brought a lot of cool edginess and excitement to the Mac platform. Uh, dude! Ultimately, it seems like Apple just threw the 4400 on the market as something to try, and then just abandoned it. I bought this unit from a guy online for $20 last December. I get to his house and expect to be invited in. Instead, he takes me to his backyard where he's been storing it in his shed. Nonetheless, this thing is in flawless shape. It's rare you'd find it in this condition. When I got a free Power Macintosh G3 desktop, the guy had the computer in his shed, and when I get it home and open it up, there's leaves in it. There's leaves in here. The 4400 had very little yellowing, as compared to other ones I've seen. Yellowing is a tragic side effect of the fire retardant they had to add to the plastic. When exposed to UV radiation and moisture in the air over years, it goes from a platinum gray to a dull beige or dark yellow. Up to this point, and as far as I'm aware, the only Mac which didn't have the additive in the plastic was the Macintosh Portable. Well, except the spacebar. At least it's fireproofed. The Portable is a sad reminder of how good these Macs could look if not for that additive. The angry video game nerd had a different theory on yellowing. And for some reason, lots of Super NES consoles turn yellow over time. I don't know why. Maybe everyone pisses on them. I don't piss on mine. Okay, okay. The 4400 I bought also came with the Apple Multiple Scan 15AV display. It was the monitor that the 4400 would typically be paired with. If you connected an audio cable, the sound would be routed to the monitor's uh, lovely side speakers, and you could plug headphones into the front. The monitor kind of rotated on the base, and the upfront picture controls made it a serviceable monitor, but not amazing. It was a multi-sync monitor, capable of resolutions from 512 by 384 to 1024 by 768 Though the high resolution was criticized at the time for being a bit much for a 15-inch monitor. Anytime you read about the 4400 online, the claim to fame is that it's the only Mac where the floppy drive is on the left side. But they always stop short of telling you why it was this way. But I suspect it simply made the most sense based on the very different motherboard design. We open it up. First we take out this link bar which supports the weight of the monitor. The hard drive is vertically mounted on a carrier and can simply be pulled out of a special bracket. The CD and floppy drives were also mounted in a carrier and can be just pulled out as one piece. And not the easiest to reattach I learned. Looks like they made plans to accommodate a second drive, maybe the popular zip drive. I'll remove the riser card. This three slot card was built specifically for the 4400. While the European 160 megahertz had three PCI slots on the card, the 200 megahertz replaced the first slot with a communication card slot which had a modem installed. 
a 33.6K modem which you would directly connect your phone line to. As such, you are physically prevented from connecting an external modem. Here I'm pulling out the Tanzania motherboard. It featured the 603E PowerPC chip, a power efficient chip, and the tiny heatsink makes that obvious. It was the enhanced version of the 603 and up until now relegated to portables and performers. Mid-range to high-end Max got the much faster 604E with a giant heatsink and mounted on a daughter card making them upgradable. Speed-wise, the 4400 was pretty low on the totem pole when compared to other Macs and Mac clones available, yet still twice as fast as the Power Mac 7100. For RAM, the first RAM slot came maxed out with the 32MB single bank DIMM. 32MB was pretty good, most of the competing clones were still giving you 16MB. The second and third RAM slots could each hold 64MB dual bank memory chips, making 160MB RAM the maximum for the 4400. The RAM was the cutting edge 3.3V DIMMs instead of the standard 5V. This helped reduce power consumption, and in the case of the 4400, it had to be special low profile 1.1 inch tall cards since the taller variants would get crushed when you closed up the machine. There was an optional 256K L2 cache, which is installed in this machine. Even though the Tanzania schematic references a ROM slot, the slot is not even soldered in on the 4400. Instead, 4 megabytes worth of surface mounted ROM chips, which was kind of backwards to the chirp specification that Apple was supposedly working towards, which would see ROM removed completely from the board and put into system software. And then the video RAM here, in this case 2 megabytes, but could be as high as 4 megabytes. The board was obviously designed for flexibility with the StarMax clones having many unused solder points. Also, the industry standard power supply included six power plugs, even though you would never have more than two internal devices in the 4400. And of course, the Gaimo port, which is um, on the bottom of the case, instead of a laminated Apple sticker, we just see this, a paper sticker, which reads Igloo HSF for Cupid 2. Now, the 4400 had the Apple internal code name Cupid, and Igloo means, um, pfft. Oh wait, the laminated sticker is on the back. Now, the guy I bought it from said it doesn't boot. You just do anything? But the 4400 is one of those Macs that will not start up if there's a dead clock battery. This was during the short window of time when Apple was installing these 4.5 volt block batteries instead of the standard 3.6 volt half AA. Those block batteries are extinct, so the best option at this point is to manufacture a replacement for modern components. These mini LED flashlights will often have a 4.5 volt AAA battery casing. So just clip the wires off the dead block battery, strip the wires back a bit, and solder to the terminals of the battery casing. There. Okay, let's try and boot it up. But the boot chime seems like it's cut short for some reason. Let's compare to the 8500-180. Yeah, it's short. 8600? I'd say maybe the sustain is proportional to how powerful the computer is, but if that was true, this would be the Performa 6200 chime. The 4400 came with system 7.53 and required an enabler to work because of the different motherboard architecture. Apple did not invest in making 7.55 work with the 4400. 
nor OS 7.6, which was the newest version at release time. With Mac users unsettled about the continuous delays of the next generation Copeland OS, 7.6 was released to roll out some of the finished features. Here's a mailer I got from Apple at the time. Get my kicks. I didn't actually check that box, it was printed that way. Despite this letter from Gil Emilio, I never bought into 7.6 for my Power Mac. Visual concepts leap from your mind and dance in your documents. I get the feeling Gil didn't actually write this. And it was $99 on CD-ROM or $129 on floppy. The 4400 would finally work with the 7.61 update, released April 1997, and 4400 buyers could upgrade directly to 7.61 for only $24. 7.61 was required for the PC compatible models, and that's why they didn't ship till April. My 4400 was manufactured September 29th, 1997, which is even after OS 8 was released, and it still came with 753. In fact, I doubt they ever shipped with an OS update. It just showed they didn't put a lot of resources in the 4400, especially with how many product lines they had. And I don't think it sold very well. In the summer of 1997, they sent me coupons, including a $200 rebate if I bought a 4400. It came with not just the standard mouse and microphone, but Apple was throwing in the keyboard as well. And this is one where the power button on the keyboard could be used to power up the computer. The computer came with two Apple CD-ROMs, the System Software Restore and the Tutorial Restore. Software was executable from the launcher, a Performa innovation and similar to the OS X dock except you could put your apps in categories, which was kind of neat. It looks like the 4400 original release came with just the OS because it was a low cost machine, but in this small business version you got all kinds of software some of which was obviously snagged from the Performa line. Like in the tutorial, they keep calling it a Performa. Here's the tutorial. Welcome to part one of the Performa tutorial. In this training program, you'll learn the basics of working with your computer. There is a second tutorial for mouse skills. Hello, I'll be guiding you through mouse skills, where you'll practice using the mouse. You double click an icon to open it. Watch me to see how to double click the hard disk icon to open it. You move the mouse until the pointer is over the icon. Then click the mouse button twice rapidly. See that the hard disk icon opens. Oh, Marathon 2! Speaking of the mouse, Marathon was one of the earliest shooter games that let you use the mouse during gameplay. The first surprise when playing Marathon 2 was that the civilians from Marathon 1, nicknamed Bobs, were now armed and show up in force to clear this first room for you. There, we're through the first wave of enemies. Good. I'm going to quit that program for you for now. What? Damn! There's just one more mouse skill for you to learn. Okay, enough with you and your Macintosh 2SI with a Apple Color high resolution monitor. Let's move on. What's going on here? Make sure the cable points away from you. There was Norton Utilities included, except it was the 1995 version of the software. If you try and gauge your system speed, it has no idea what a 603E processor is and misreads the clock frequency. It then goes on to compare the 4400 to cutting edge machines from 1994. You got a standard edition of Microsoft Office 4.2.1. Microsoft Office for Macintosh is the most widely used suite of productivity applications on the Macintosh today. It would be later superseded. Hey, I'm talking. It would later be superseded by Office 98, only after Steve Jobs made his famous deal with Bill Gates. And uh, I happen to have a special guest with me today uh, via satellite downlink. And uh, if we could uh, get him up on the stage right now.
Microsoft Bookshelf 9697. The disc should be in the plastic wallet, but it looks like the previous owner decided to keep the CD for that one. And there were other financial packages, so a decent system for a small business. The Apple Internet Connection Kit, or also known by the cool acronym ACHE, it came free. Ake supposedly sold for $50, but Apple seemed to be offering it for free or discounted with pretty much every OS upgrade or home computer. And Ake was just an aggregate of internet software, the key piece being Apple Dialer, which made connections to your service provider much easier. Few could have predicted back then how pervasive the internet would become. Get out of here! Emilio had kept Apple solvent by the skin of his teeth. Selling debentures to raise money, he had to cut a third of Apple's staff, and Apple's finances had really taken a hit, but mostly from restructuring expenses and the purchase of Steve Jobs' company Next, the basis of OS X. The cuts and strategic decisions Emilio had to make to save Apple ended up alienating him from the remaining employees and strategic partners. Then in July 1997, a major Apple stockholder dumped 1.5 million Apple shares. The board panicked, seeing it as a vote of non-confidence in Emilio's strategy. They asked for Emilio's resignation just a year and a half into his five-year contract. Strategic advisor Steve Jobs was given an expanded role in the company until a new CEO could be found. And the mysterious shareholder? Well, his identity may never be known. With Emilio gone, Steve was able to take total control over the company at that point. And really, he was what Apple needed now that the hard cuts had been made. A respected and influential leader. When the Power Mac G3 desktop was released in November 1997, as fast as even the 9600, and for a price of $1,999, that pretty much put an end to the demand for the 4400, not to mention all clones. That's because G3 chips needed Mac OS 8, which Apple opted not to license to clone makers, thereby wiping them out. Kinda wish we had Macintosh clones these days. Only four Apple product lines survived the G3 transition. 3000 PowerBook, 5000 All-in-One, 7000 Desktop, and 8000 Tower, but now with the new G3 names. The 4400 was discontinued in February 1998, we think. Even Apple is not really sure when it was discontinued. Like all second generation Power Macs, Mac OS support ended with Mac OS 9.1. Are you finished yet? Um, sure, that's all I've got, really. Looks like you've learned a lot. I have, and I hope everyone watching has too. Anyone with further insights into the 4400, please leave a comment below. Thanks everyone, and see you again in the next video. Goodbye for now, and have fun. Yeah, later. Now I can play some marathon too. Goodbye.